Hello, everyone. Welcome to JMAC Investing. My name is Jason. Thanks for tuning in to a special episode. We have today Mountain Valley MD Holdings. We have the president and CEO, Dennis Hancock, and the director of life sciences, Mike Farber, who are going to join us for an interview. And we're going to discuss their company and how they're looking to change the world. I'm going to go ahead and bring them on. Hello, gentlemen. How are you all doing? Hey, good morning, hey, Jason. Jason. So on the left, we have Mike Farber, director of life sciences. And on the right, uh, Dennis Hancock, president and CEO. If you gentlemen don't mind, maybe you just kind of give a brief introduction of yourselves, your role, and a little bit about the company. Yeah, perfect. So I'm Dennis Hancock, the president and CEO, and uh, I liken myself as the the marshaller of all the change makers that work within uh, Mountain Valley. I'm the director of life sciences. I'm responsible basically for the innovations and bringing the innovations to commercialization for MVMD. Very good. Um, like I said in, in the beginning, I do know from you know much of my research and stuff that you guys really do seem like you're trying to change the world. And maybe many people are unaware of your company at this point. Uh, some are, some are not. But hopefully today we'll be able to set some of this up so that people who have never heard of you all and what you're trying to do maybe have a be better understanding of that. And maybe if you you all can just talk a little bit about kind of your mission and some of the things that you have going on in your company that align with your mission statement and that may very well change the world. Yeah, well, I could start with a really high level, of, you know, just to give your viewers a sense of what we're doing. And then it might be great with Mike just to peel it back a layer and go into the technology. But, you know, simply put, um, our mission is more life, less death. And a lot of the things we focus on are taking existing vaccines, drugs, and even some nutraceuticals and delivering them more effectively into the body using less, increasing the, the efficacy of, of the molecule. And we have really three lanes that we do that in as a company. We have our original quick zone, uh, desiccated liposome, which is taking molecules, some of them extremely fragile and complex suspending them into rapid dissolve uh, oral uh, delivery technologies. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the, you know, the types of outputs for that. The second thing we have is a product we call Quixol. And Quixol is a solubilization patent that we filed across the macrocyclic lactone drug class. And one of those drugs that's very popular right now is ivermectin. Uh, so I think today it'll be appropriate to go a little deeper on that and, you know, what does that solubilization technique afford and, and its impact on, again, increasing bioavailability and making, in that particular case, a, you know, world-class drug more effective. And then our third um, lane is, is uh, adjuvant work. And the holy grail, um, you know, solubility helps improve uh, the effectiveness of a drug uh, absorption into the body. Uh, the dose bearing adjuvant work is all about allowing the drug to, to achieve its um, desired effect in the body, but using a fraction of it. And so we have some current trials we can talk about, but essentially, you know, the target of using one tenth or one twentieth of a drug and um, delivering it uh, more effectively. We have an overarching uh, product uh, that we're working on or a technology that doesn't fall cleanly into the three. There's potential combination, but it really aligns more with Quickzone. And our and that is work we're doing with the FDA on cold chain storage. So that might be a fourth little, you know, piece that we can talk about. But in a nutshell, you know, we're applying these technologies. Uh, they generally apply globally, but you know, as far as our mission and mandate, uh, we believe the ability to help the most disadvantaged initially uh, because of the high cost of vaccines, for example. So some of the work we're doing with ivermectin uh, is squarely focused on, you know, COVID-19 viral clearance and where would that be the most applicable? Clearly the, the most disadvantaged that can't afford vaccines or that are limited through cold chain distribution. So that's us in a nutshell. Hope that makes sense. Um, and then Mike could certainly peel back the technology um, and go a little bit deeper if that would make sense. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Okay, so let's talk about one of the most important, I believe, advances that we've made recently, which is Quixol and its application to ivermectin and selamectin. If we can 
remind your viewers that ivermectin and selamectin are already approved drugs. They've already gone through years <clears throat> of being used in animals, in humans, uh, with respect to ivermectin. They have a proven profile of safety. They have a proven acceptance globally. So all we've done is taken these drugs and we have vastly improved their solubility. And by doing that, we've not only increased the ability to deliver them in different ways, but to apply them in ways that the uh, current scientific data allows us to take advantage of. So let me give you a few examples. Ivermectin is used in animal husbandry to clear parasites, ecto and endoparasites, lice, a lot of other things, mites in, in animals. If you were able to get a better C-max, better tissue distribution, this would become a much more effective drug. It would also be able to be administered in a way that's not painful to animals and can be applied across animal husbandry to animal species that are not currently able to use ivermectin efficiently, such as poultry, which totals 60 billion units produced annually. The other thing about ivermectin, it's a drug which has been shown to have potential for cancer, shown to have potential in terms of treatments for inflammation of skin. The problem is that in its current forms, it's not highly bioavailable and it can't be used. I'll give you an example. Let's say you had a bladder cancer and you wanted to try and treat bladder cancer with a number of immunotherapies such as BCG, and you wanted to try a combination with ivermectin. Before Mountain Valley came along, you could never even aspire to do that because ivermectin could not be solubilized in a way that would allow it to be instilled safely into the bladder to use as a combinatorial uh, therapy with BCG. So what we've done is we've taken a drug that already has potential and we've removed the barrier to allow this drug to really be uh, analyzed and evaluated as a drug with potential for treating cancers, for treating all sorts of other um, immuno type of reactions like uh, inflammatory skin disease, where currently it's not being able to be used in a way that doesn't elicit uh, safety implications because you need alcohols, you need propylene glycol, a lot of things that would cause skin reactions. So by changing the way that we've made ivermectin bioavailable and solubilized it, we've eliminated all of these problems and we now see much more potential across numerous uh, types of therapies that total into you know, millions upon millions of people that can be benefited by what we're doing in just that solubilization. In the same way, <clears throat> solubilizing celemectin, which has been proven in vitro to have a potential to treat uh, resistant tuberculosis strains, we now, because of the solubilization that we've been able to achieve, it can now be looked at as an injectable or as an oral dose in humans where it could never have been used before. So this opens a whole spectrum of can we now use it to treat mycobacterium in humans, even mycobacterium in terms of cattle as an injectable. So it opens up a tremendous spectrum of the ability to treat diseases that can't be treated with these microsaccharide lactones currently because of their limitations of solubility and bioavailability. And I think that speaks to the real important work that we're doing in terms of global disease, global uh, problems. Very good. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, the the use use cases seem like they're very vast with with that type of uh, solution there. And so, as far as that becoming financially viable to to you guys, where do where do where do you where do you stand as far as that becoming something that's producing revenue uh, for your company? Yeah, great question. So even to take a little bit of what Mike was intimating towards, if we were just to pick up on on the Ivectasol, which is our solubilized ivermectin, um, right now we have trials going on in a BSL-4 lab testing uh, its effectiveness on viral clearance. Uh, we've already seen through the work of Dr. Corey and FLCCC, uh, there's a mountain of evidence about the safety and efficacy of, of ivermectin. What our technique would do, again, we're using one fifth to one eighth of the drug, right? So there starts to be a financial formula in the API, which is the 
you know, the, the raw uh, ingredient, if you will, the drug. And so if you can take that and use less of it, there's a, there's a significant case there. Um, you know, so the idea of just picking COVID clearance, we imagine a rapid dissolve wafer being administered like vitamin C globally that would stop future variants, um, different strains. And I've said many times before that this is really COVID-19's mother nature softball. This is, it's cost, you know, 30 trillion in damage now economically and, and uh, two and a half million deaths globally. It's obviously uh, catastrophic on many levels, but this isn't the one <laughs> that unfortunately, uh, you know, there's you know, much higher death rates uh, and future pandemics absolutely ensured. So when we start to imagine the financial modeling around being, you know, something that can be administered without water as one example, uh, sp particularly in third world countries, and then having a solubilized format that can be injected, frontline, you know, healthcare, um, you know, tens of billions of dollars would just be in that revenue stream. And then if you were to apply in the non-human, you know, example, as Mike was alluding to in husbandry animals, um, what's really cool about a solubilized uh, format um, that Mike brought up, even poultry and duck and, you know, all the small game and, you know, that side of, of the husbandry animal, um, you, you can imagine um, 60 or 70 billion animals a year that currently you wouldn't administer ivermectin in the format that we're imagining. And we're doing advanced work on needleless applicators. So opening up a hair follicle, injecting it in, <laughs> that's what enables you to go after these smaller species effectively uh, because today it's delivered with a thick straw, like, um, you know, 12 or 14 gauge <laughs> needle um, that's sort of putting molasses in. You couldn't do that in, in small mammals, frankly, without killing them. You know, that's just one lane, one application. <laughs> it's, in, it's... I, just in terms of uh, the application in the U.S., let's say that we would get approved for the same for the same types of infection that's currently used, like stromectal. So we've already gone the step of approaching the FDA, and we're in the process of putting in what's called a 505 B2 application. That would allow us to do a, one study to bridge the PK data and to get approval for this sublingual wafer in the United States. And when, let's say, the FDA and the NIH agree and ivermectin becomes useful in terms of treating viral infections, we'll be right there with our approval that it can be used off-label or even extended label into the other applications. So we're in that, and a 505B2 is fairly quick in relationship to being approved. You can talk anywhere from a year to two and a half years for approval. Not like a drug where if you start from scratch, it can be seven years to 10 years and cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So we're also following that pathway within the United States for approval and then to enlarge its applications. If you were to build outside of you know the, that one lane and just start to say, well, tell me more about the dose bearing adjuvant revenues as an example. The ability to do, um, you know, to deliver one tenth or one twentieth of a vaccine um, starts to, in its own right, just think of uh, the immediate applications for, uh, you know, vaccine costs. If you're able to use one tenth or one twentieth of a dose, so that's a very uh, big, big opportunity financially, and it's something our pharmaceutical partners um, can immediately do. And then we also have our Quicksome lane, which has a, a variety of applications in nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, vaccines, et cetera. And um, a lot of that work uh, also adds up to, you know, a very significant um, category for us. So multi, multi-billion dollar yeah. total, total addressable market for, for just this one particular product lineup, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, well, you know, that's uh, quite encouraging from an uh, investor standpoint. Your market cap right now is what, like 500 million? Yeah, yeah. We've, yeah, well, that's, we're hovering between four and 500 million, correct. Right. So that's yeah, quite a bit of upside potential uh, to get some, that just, and then we're just talking one of your, one of your products there. So um, that's encouraging for sure. Um, so Cold Chain is, is a separate uh, entity. 
Yeah, so cold chain, um, we've already done some work with the FDA's polio lab on cold chain. And um, we've been playing with it in our rapid dissolve strips. And uh, what's been really interesting as we've evolved it, we've come up with a technique to lay our desiccated liposome with the IPV, the, the inactivated polio virus or vaccine, sorry, and test that. Um, that actually test is uh, undertaking as we speak. And we're testing in five degree increments, 30 degrees, 35 and 40 degrees Celsius. And today, just so people understand cold chain, there's a band of two to eight degrees that most drugs and vaccines are manufactured and uh, distributed in. And when you start to go into third world countries, back to the start of this about what is our mission and where will we make an impact, a lot of um, third world countries, in fact, up to 90% don't have the electricity infrastructure to support the cold chain logistics needed. And, um, you know, there's, I've read 17 billion a year in expenditures on the logistics side. And then another 35 billion a year, people would be shocked to learn just an annual disposal of drugs and vaccines that break cold chain and they're not, they don't have the confidence to be delivered. So that's a $50 billion problem as an example of cold chain, something that we can help our partners, you know, deliver to those most needed but also give us certainty that the drugs will, will be delivered and meet, you know, where they're needing uh, to get, uh, which is critical. Right. Um, and you guys had a recent uh, press release about uh, Bangladesh. Uh, you guys want to touch on that and talk about the implications of what that potentially, you know, has for you guys. Yeah, that one, that's very exciting. And, and uh, we were really proud to be working uh, directly with, um, some very senior government officials inside Bangladesh. Um, most people don't realize, you know, it's the eighth most populous country in the world, as half the population of the United States is an example. So very significant uh, partnership to be working at that level. And there's a good example where we're taking our Ivectasol product and going full speed into husbandry animal testing against um, cattle, goat, and poultry. And going aggressively um, after the testing side of it, working directly with um, the, uh, the government there locally and under supervised facilities. And what that does for us on a fast track to commercialization, we're not presenting you know, data that we did over here with a third party uh, research organization and presenting it with a bunch of you know, consideration asterisks. We're actually doing the work directly with them. And then in the meantime, we've been um, securing our pharmaceutical production pipeline because we plan on uh, producing all of our Avectasol globally out of that hub uh, in Bangladesh. And um, that starts to be really amazing. First of all, they've got uh, quality to the EU and FDA standards of production that we've secured. And then there's a cost competitiveness that, that really allows us to get to ensuring that those that need it the most, uh, whether it be in the farm communities or um, you know, human applications, as we get on that path with them as well, that it's, it's there as a production hub, but it can, can be administered quickly and, and, and locally. You know, we have access to, to all, you know, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Bangladesh itself. Very exciting hub for us as a company. Very good. Very good. Uh, so uh, for, for investors interested in the company, I would just want, wanted to point out that the ticker symbol in the U.S. is MVMDF and in Canada it's MVMD. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We are traded on the OTC in the U.S. and on the CSE here in uh, Canada. Gotcha. Thank you. And then I also wanted to point out like kind of what I, uh, I just don't really want to go over it, but your website has a has your pipeline that you can go on and uh to me it's kind of foreign because i'm not you know uh in medical but uh just wanted to point it out if anyone wanted to go and see where you are time frame uh you know kind of you know what the quarter 2021 q1 q2 q3 where all of these things stand you can you can see so very good job on your site there yeah, thank you. There is a little thing you glossed over, which which we love is this. We always say MVMD moves faster, and it's a hashtag that we use 
And uh, that pipeline's a lot of evidence of that. And again, because we're using, um, as Mike said, it, you know, approved drugs and vaccines and nutraceuticals, you know, we're not starting from scratch. We're taking world-class drugs. Yeah, that's a great shot of it there. We're taking world-class drugs and making them more effective through delivery technologies and ultimately increasing the efficacy of their impact into the body. And uh, I do say though, man, we, uh, Mike and his team have been relentless on just pursuing the science and our formulation work. And then the change makers that I alluded to at the start, they're not just in in our building, you know, we have amazing uh, third party partners and the people that we tend to attract to our work are very innovative, very fast. They kind of quickly get in into the culture that we've created and, you know, change makers that are making a difference, uh, is, you know, it's been a really cool uh, mantra for us. Very good. Very good. If you don't mind, I, um, I, I, I became aware of you all through I run a private discord and some of the investors in that group are the one that surfaced your company to me personally. And um, so I, had, I, do, I did open it up to allow some user submitted questions. So if we don't mind, because uh, these guys, are, okay, cool. These, these guys are a little bit more in tune. So um, the first one question from a user was, besides the polio vaccine, are there other diseases where MVMD is applying its dose sparing adjuvant? And are there any trials in other countries? Well, currently we're just out to prove with polio that we can use uh, dose sparing with our adjuvant. And then of course, there are a myriad uh, array of vaccines that use aluminum based adjuvants to enhance their activity. So all of those vaccines that use aluminum will benefit from the type of, of adjuvant that we've invented. So proof of concept will be done with polio out of Tulane and then we'll start applying it in other trials to other vaccines with a probably a selected partner at that point. Okay. Next one was kind of a statement. Would like to know about the status of the cold chain results. Mm. So that's a good one as well. Uh, that project uh, candidly has been behind schedule. Um, they physically, as we speak now are in possession and, and the trials are commencing. Um, we are about four weeks behind on that, and that candidly was just a raw material supply issue in, in our network with COVID. Um, but that means we are probably several weeks from getting that data, um, but they are officially underway, and we're very excited about that work. Okay. All right. Very good. So <laughs> this one is a, is a space everyone's interested in. I'm gonna just I'm gonna just going to call it the MJ space, okay? Uh, so it says... Uh, where are they with applying their technology with the MJ and psychedelic market with Quixum technology? And are they in talks with anyone for partner licensing? Yeah, so there's there's a couple ways I could quickly answer that question. So first of all, we've already done a nutraceutical deal with Circadian Wellness. Um, Circadian Wellness is a, a new mushroom company um, that's doing some really cool product work they absolutely will be moving into the psychedelic mushroom category. Um, the other way to answer that question is um, some of the work we're doing on the cannabinoid side of the business with both CBD and THC. And we're very far along on a partnership agreement there to produce, um, you know, Mountain Valley's pivoted fully out of cannabis in one hand, but we're focusing in on applying our technology squarely back into that industry. And there's some really amazing product advantages, both in the mushroom example and the, and the cannabis example, because a lot of, um, as you know, a lot of the regulatory requirements around packaging, you know, 10 milligram, uh, for example, as, as the capacity in edibles uh, here in Canada. Now we can take something and deliver a more impactful dose at the 10 milligram that would be the equivalent of taking you know, three or four or five edibles, again, whatever you design, whatever you control could also go down to uh, five, two milligram um, edibles as well, depending on what the, what the effect is, but the ability, you know, with what we didn't mention in Quicksome, what we love about it is the, is the low variability, the precision, um, even in the recreation space, we like to imagine, you know, people knowing, Hey, I drink a Coors light. And this is the exact effect on me as an adult or, 
you know, so, you know, that precision um, is what our Quicksilm technology allows across that psychedelic space, which we believe is very responsible and very important. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I guess the uh, applications are, are very vast uh, with, with that technology for uh, no doubt. Um, and including prescriptions, I should say as well. I, that's the whole other lane that both of those has as both of those pieces can start to be prescribed. The medical certainty of a quick zone technology is critical for that as well. Got you. Um, and then I guess this, this is the final question from the user submitted ones. Uh, so uh, this person says, would really like to understand what the revenue forecast is. And, and I know some of this, you, you can only uh, say so much being publicly traded, but uh, what your revenue forecast is once they achieve approval for commercializing Ivectol in Bangladesh. So what, what kind of boost would that do to your bottom line, I guess? Yeah, so there's no forecast that start, you know, I can say candidly as we start to achieve things, there's no forecast that doesn't, you know, add up to a billion dollars as a starting point. Um, we've avoided getting too far ahead because we're in a science lane. Um, we have pivoted as a company with different things, trial and error. Mike and his team are very good at moving fast, but not recklessly, you know, making sure that, you know, what we learn from each each piece, each, each bit of science. And there's been a few times we've, we've uh, been able to enhance our technology and deliver it more effectively. So revenue um, is near and it's fast in the nutraceutical space. Uh, we've got some really exciting stuff happening there. That's very easy, very quick. The benefit of working, as I suggested, at the government level inside Bangladesh, we are talking about a 90 day you know, cycle to be in a first production format against a commercialization project. And so we're far along, I've been in business long enough not to get too caught on you know, 30 day cycles. Um, things happen, doors will open um, and some doors close, but the agreements we're working on now um, are all uh, predicated on the success that we're expecting. And again, even in our BSL level four trials, very difficult to get into those facilities, less than 30 of them even in the world. Uh, we were fast tracked with those trials are underway that too will open a massive door for licensing uh, not just direct production from from mountain valley uh, so i love the revenue question we're we're excited about committing this business to that lane um, you should also know we have you know uh, 18 or 19 million dollars in cash on hand so we're not you know revenue we're going to move effectively in revenue but there's no reason there's no hand strings, if you will, that will tie us back from achieving what we're planning on. Very good, very good. It, uh, I mean, from from uh, my research and and what and what I'm beginning to understand, I mean, it almost sounds like the uh, you guys deliver on some of this, and uh, you may or may not want to be acquired, but I think some offers are potentially <laughs> the, the Johnson and Johnsons, Pfizer's, and AstraZeneca's that were AstraZeneca. They, they need a boost right now, don't they? Right. So, um, but those types of uh, players could, uh, uh, could maybe be putting, <laughs> putting offers out to you guys if you deliver on some of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, that's a good sort of reminder of what do we do? And we are focused on shareholder value. So uh, we're not focused on creating jobs for ourselves. I do have shareholders that have sort of messaged us and said, you know, please fulfill your mission. I think the work we're doing is so game changing and so impactful that we would we would want anyone that was to take the reins of this type of company to do good work with it. Um, you know, so that would be a big filter. Um, right now, we're not building a company to sell it. We're building a company to deliver unprecedented revenue in a time frame of a biotech company, which naturally would open up those discussions. Um, lots of ways to participate with us, whether it's licensing molecules by market, you know, by lane, um, acquiring us that, you know, that's, a, again, we're not for sale, but I do get the inevitable point that you're making as, as we start to deliver game changing things, companies that are in that space are, are clearly uh, taking notice of the work we're doing. Very good. Very good. Uh, well, I don't think I have any, any other questions. I mean, anything else that you guys wanted to cover, uh, you know, while, while you got the stage and, uh, anything that you wanted to address for, because most of my viewers are U.S. and maybe your first time, you know, really getting to know you guys. So anything, anything else you wanted to cover? 
Well, you know, it's a the, the one trend that's been happening right uh, lately relative to shareholder value. What I would say, um, I've said this from the first day I got involved with this company, um, we're not building a share price. We're building a company that will, frankly, kick ass on every metric people have imagined in the time frame that we're doing. And um, it's interesting right now because, you know, we, a lot of our shareholders get energy. In December, we were trading, you know, under 10 cents. And now we've been trading, you know, as high as $2. And there's a bit of a roller coaster. And I would just say to those that are that are nervous about that, hang in there, don't get sidetracked, understand what you're part of. Um, I've described it many times, like we are building a rocket ship. And if you want a seat on it, don't worry about picking the seat, just get on board. Um, we're doing exciting things. And uh, I've said this many times, I think we're one of the most undervalued stocks on the planet. If you understand what we're doing, you do your homework on the on the science, you do the, you know, the, the work that's gone into the space before us is a proxy for just how exciting uh, times we're in and know that we're not, again, building a share price. We're building a company that is going to, you know, uh, catapult through all of this into something really incredible. So my final parting thing is simply a thank you. Thank you to those that have sort of believed in what we're doing and got on board. Thanks to those that have supported Mike and his team. Like the change makers, I don't use that word lightly, the talent uh, that has gotten involved from our advisory boards and even the FDA polio lab opening their their uh, their doors to us and their talents to us. We learn from them, we grow with them. And so, you know, my final comments is just a massive thank you to all those that are believing in what we're doing. Really awesome. Uh, Dennis, Mike, I really appreciate you gents coming on the show and sharing. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you and real real interesting uh things that you guys are approaching and and looking to you know really really you know like you said the the sky's the limit on uh the things that you could accomplish that could affect the world and then also financially kind of what else investors are also yeah. interested in as well um could could be a uh two two two, two and one <laughs> here so uh i appreciate you all coming and i uh, hope you have a great rest of your week Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Great to see you.